Do you want to play better golf? Of course you do. Well, here are three easy ways to do it. One, open your smartphone and look for the podcast app. Two, open the podcast app and search Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan. Three, subscribe and never miss an episode of great golf instructor interviews from around the world. A new guest every week, like David Ledbetter, Brian Manzella, Dr. Sashal McKenzie, James Siegman, just to name a few. Hear their insight as they deliver their wisdom of the game. Take control of your game. Subscribe today. Your game will thank you for it. Welcome to Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan, the golf podcast that interviews the best and brightest minds in the golf industry. Now, here's your host, Bernard Sheridan. Tyler, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks so much for being with us today and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to, this is actually my first podcast interview, so um, I'm excited to go through the process and see how this whole thing goes oh that's great so so I'm glad that that um, that we were able to get the exclusive first yeah. <laughs> so, there, so and that's wonderful there we go so are uh, the first question that we always ask is when is the very first time that you picked up a golf club uh, I was about 13 um, I went down to my uh, grandfather's place in uh, Williamsburg Virginia and uh, he lived on Ford's Colony, and we went out one afternoon, and he just had some old clubs, and my brother and I just kind of hit some balls at the range, and I was I was hooked. You know, I went home and went to a yard sale and bought a twenty dollar set of really old, you know, they had plastic grips, but I, I bought a set and just started practicing in the backyard. Um, so that was how I got my start. And did you get involved in, uh, I mean, did you just continue to play from then and get involved in like, uh, you know, collegiate golf and, and uh, so things I, of that nature? Yeah, I got involved with um, the, so there was a neighbor behind my house who who was a member at the local club and he actually took out his mower and, and mowed like a, a small little green and put a flag in the common area for me to, to practice with until I got a junior membership at the, at the club. Um, but it was really just hitting around in the backyard and then playing. Um, we had like an intramural team at my junior high. Okay. That I started. So I did that and then played three years of high school golf before playing three years of collegiate golf. Nice. So picked it up pretty quickly and just, just got going with it. Now, was there any time that, um, that, that you didn't do golf? Or, or in other words, as a profession? Or did you, did you decide, you know... I love this so much. I want to get into this. I want to. I want to do this. Uh, so it was. Um, I my first sport was basketball. I played basketball and tennis in high school, and then kind of picked up golf later. And so when I when I shifted from playing basketball to playing golf, my I just naturally shifted the goals of well, I want to be a professional athlete, so I want to be a professional golfer. Um, and in when I was in college. Uh, Dr. Greg Rose, the founder of TPI, yeah. um, he uh, he opened up a golf gym 10 minutes from where my parents lived. So I went there one winter and um, went on the tour, and the, the membership prices were out of my price range, so I asked for a job. Um, and so I, I got started as a bag boy or the janitor at Club Golf. And uh, the, the deal there was if I if I had the place clean, I could practice as much as I wanted, or I could shadow Greg. So, for about two years, I just kind of followed Greg around and listened to him explain 3D graphs and and that kind of stuff. And so, when I when I graduated college, I had a a conversation with Greg where basically he talked me out of trying to play pro, and he thought I'd have a a decent. He, he the way he phrased it was, I think this 3D thing might take off. And you you understand the graphs really well. I, I think you could have a career there. So he he talked me out of going down to Florida and trying to play professionally, and and got me more on the coaching side, which was a great you know I didn't have the 
Um, I probably wasn't going to hold up physically to the demands of professional golf, and I had too many other interests. Like what I've noticed working with prof- the you know elite pro- professional golfers is all they want to do is go out and practice, and. I had more of the basketball mentality. I wanted to practice like two or three hours a day and then go do other stuff. So it, that fits a lot better in coaching than it did in playing. Absolutely. Um, I, I know that it's, it's really to play at that level. You have to, that's all you have to do. I mean, and that's not that easy to do too financially. Um, you got to no. have somebody to back you up there because it's, you know, how are you going to eat and pay for a roof over your head? if all you're doing is practicing and and you sure as heck don't want to sleep in a tent because that really wouldn't be very good for your physical being correct (laughs) absolutely even though you could probably do that in florida because it's you know it's warm enough that you could be living outside all the time but who the heck wants to do that right right um so then you so then when when that happened um did you did you start your own academy did you uh start to work with greg did i mean where was the next step from there um so i was working at greg's gym club golf um and when i graduated college and i actually thought i was going to go into more the business side of of kind of running you know golf training programs or something like that i i i got more involved with the the owner who bought it from greg um and what ended up happening was uh, he he came in and and put a big marketing plan together. So we we had this uh, marketing promotion for a big open house, and we had all these new members come in and join. Well, at the open house, um, Lance Gill was the head trainer, uh, or Lance Gill and Bobby Duvall were the two head trainers, and Lance Gill injured his back demonstrating bad posture for four hours. So oh we had just signed up all of these new members, and we had nobody to administer the uh, the evaluation. Now I had gone through the certification, uh, Greg's original certification, Advantage Golf, so that I understood what we were doing, so I could sell it better. So I I volunteered to to help Lance. Basically, Lance would sit in a chair for that first week, and just I was his puppet. You okay. know, I'd walk him through the tests and. So I had a, a real kind of apprenticeship um, of getting into more the golf fitness side. And what I found was that I just, I really liked that the problem solving aspect of how to get someone to move better. So I started on the golf fitness side and then it wasn't until uh, about seven or eight years into my career that I shifted more to the golf instruction side. But the, the whole time um, I was very fortunate to have access to the 3D analysis system so I was whether it was doing exercise or coaching golf it was always based on 3d data and now 3d data now is starting is has come a tremendous long way um, and some of it is is uh, is wireless and and some mm-hmm. of it is, is still not um, but uh, but so so what since you were there kind of like at the infantile stages of this um, what do you feel uh, has been a huge improvement uh, that you've seen and what do you think could be a bigger improvement moving forward from here um those are those are great questions um i I think the biggest thing um that i've I've seen over the last you know 15 years is kind of i've kind of gone with this industry um i'd say that the quality of the cause and effect focus has gotten a lot better you know when i took lessons in college it was a lot more, you know, generic and vague and, you know, you just kind of try to get the club to do this. A lot of instructors trying to give me thoughts of ways to feel it per se. Um, and, and now what I see more of is, um, by understanding the cause of effect, you know, what are the factors that actually move low point? So, you know, what, what do you do differently with your body in order to move low point from for from behind the ball to in front of the ball? What, what are the actual movements that move the club? Um, so like if you're trying to change your path or your contact or how you create speed, um, we're, I think we're at a pretty good place where we, we understand what will make those changes. Now, how you get someone to make those changes is still the, what I think is the, the big room for, uh, the opportunity for improvement. That's where I think we can continue to get better 
as an industry and where I try to, to study and evolve my teaching. Sure. So, and I know that, um, well, I mean, low point is huge. And uh, I know that, you know, with we, even though we're not using a lot of 3D technology at Impact Zone where I am um, with Bobby Clampett, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're still really, low point is, is one of the main dynamics that we're constantly working on. So you mentioned um, helping students move that low point forward. So what are some of the things that you do with your students to help them achieve that? Um, so, you know, I, because of my background from the exercise side, I, I do a lot of um, awareness or isolation drills to figure out how to move a part of your body differently and then to add speed to that movement or, or feel how force is gonna feel and then um, and then finally add the club to it. So I, I can get into more and more details, but as a, a simple sense, I tell students that low point is roughly controlled by where your upper body or your sternum is pointing and what your arms are doing. So the timing and the, and the uh, movements of your arms as they relate to that sternum location will dictate where low point is. Um, so I'll do drills where I'll have them purposefully move low point backward, move low point forward, either with their sternum or with their arm timing and, and kind of figure out which is the, the better pattern for them. Which one can they control it easier with? Sure, because if their sternum is pointing behind the ball or is hanging back, it's almost impossible for them to get their low point ahead of the ball. Um, right, or, so if they, if they did that, then they would need a lot of, you know, they would need their arms basically on the left half of the body. They would need to um, keep a ton of wrist extension in that trail wrist in order to kind of counterbalance it. Sure, which is not a very natural thing and could, and could definitely cause... Um, over time injuries um, or, or, or stress to those joints and, and to those muscle groups um, without a doubt. And I know that um, uh, I've always, uh, you know, before I became an impact zone instructor, um, sternum and low point was something that I always worked on with my students. Um, we still work on that. It's not, we don't get as much into that as we do giving them drills to help them do that but it is it is something that that we do touch base on there's no doubt about it and and uh it, i think too that you know a lot of a lot of um players believe that it's uh you know move their weight shift their weight or or things like that and you can still shift your weight ahead but still not have that sternum aiming in the right position and still not have what's happening so now it translates into fuel. So, so when you do it with, so what is the type of 3D technology that you're using at this moment um, when you're working with your students? Um, so I'm at a, I'm, I'm now the director of instruction at La Rinconada um, out in uh, Los Gatos, California. I uh, started there in May. Um, I've had my own eight sensor AMM system um, okay. for the last six, seven years. I've, I've pretty much um, used AMM since the you know since 2002 or three when I when I first got into this stuff, um, so I'm very comfortable with that system and, and reading those graphs and um, I've I've been fortunate enough that because of my of being connected to the 3D world since really its infancy, um, I get I get a lot of tour coaches asking me to look at their players, so I've been able to to build a pretty uh, sizable database um, and. From, I, I think that's one of the big missing pieces for a lot of 3D practitioners is since they don't have access to the actual database, they have to rely on what the governing bodies say. So, you right. know, if 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 TBI or KVEST or Gears or whoever, if everyone says, well, this is what the best players do, then you you just kind of have to take it at good faith. Um, I've been fortunate enough to see a lot of the data and know which ones are more let's say generalizations which ones are more absolute which one which ones i think really relate to consistency and 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 so on what are um, some of that data points that that you would say um uh would benefit uh, a mid handicap player um to to help them improve their low point and and um and is it possible for 
for the average player to be able to um, create some of these uh, data points that that like these professionals are doing because they're you know there's they're an elite few. Yeah, I mean, um, I I think that they can do their version of it, right? So like, um, a, an eighty year old can can walk as well as a Usain Bolt, but Usain Bolt has figured out how to take that walking to a whole nother level and, and create a lot more speed and, and does it at a, you know, better than the 80 year old, but you can still train the pattern, which will give you the consistency, the contact at your level. Um, so one of the things that I've, I've seen and I've I've kind of, um, mentioned in a few uh, presentations that I've done, um, I think that the, while the kinematic sequence gives a lot of information, I don't think it's the end-all, be-all of consistency. The the graph that I tend to rely on the most, which I think um, can help the average golfer, is something referred to as arc width. So, whenever whenever I'm working with a golfer, I and they ask for more consistency, I always turn it around and ask, well, what does a consistent swing look like? And they'll they'll usually throw out some generic, you know tempo and intention and while all those things relate i think if we were to design a swing around consistency it would be relatively on plane and it would have the width on the target side of the golf ball or after impact and sure. arc width arc width for me is the best um, measure for that width on the follow-through side of the golf ball now the important thing to understand is when you change one thing how does it in- influence the other variables so when you get the arc width later, um, by default, when you create more shaft lean, that tends to open up the face. So you have to change how you coordinate the face and, you know, the timing of how your body moves. Like you'll have to make a couple changes, but usually it comes down to one or two drills that kind of teach you how to coordinate that all together. Um, in order to change the face, are you working with grip or, or is it just, or is it something else in the sequencing of the body? Um, so I'll give them, I give them the options. Uh, you know, we, the, the problem with if you just change the grip is it doesn't necessarily impact low point as well as if you were to improve the, the wrist release mechanics. Um, that was the, the wrist, the release and the 3d graphs of the, of the arm motions is probably where I got, um, you know, more of my popularity. Um, I, when, when the Facebook groups popped up, you know, that Nick Shertok developed, um, I got involved with the biomechanics group fairly early on. Mm-hmm. And, um, my, my expertise from seeing all these data points of these tour pros was presenting the risk graphs and the, the commonalities that I saw there, because I thought there were lots of other good 3d people talking about what the body was doing. And there wasn't enough being described about what the hands were doing and how those work. Um, so in general, most amateurs, because they tend to, they almost want to keep the club face in the same orientation compared to the body. And they don't want to, um, they don't have soft enough forearms and they don't have enough shaft rotation to allow them to get, uh, you know, good body alignment that would move the low point forward. Basically they use moving the low point backward and, um, squaring up the, the face by having the club pass as a way to control the direction which messes up their low point right so and then they're they're hitting ground first and correct and and they're losing a tremendous amount of uh, of not only spin on the ball but compression and 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 club head speed is going to drastically slow down too if it's not hitting the ball if it's hitting the ground first it's going to slow it up there's a lot of different variables there for sure. Um, yeah. I think that too that that's the main thing that most people have it have an issue with is uh, is low point. I mean they just can't make it happen or or it's, and I think now do you believe that a lot of that is is in a misconception of this uh, keep your eye on the ball or or you know try to mm-hmm. hit the ball or or um, you know, focus too much on the ball and worry about what I'm going to do to this ball, as opposed to focusing more using drills to let the let the body release 
more naturally like it does in other sports? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, if you're focused on hitting at the ball and you were trying to maximize everything right at the ball, then you would want your trail arm to be fully straight um, because then you'd be using it to its full capability. But the problem is if your trail arm is fully straight, then you have no slack to widen and create more width in the follow through. So if like by definition with the arc width, if I'm trying to get the arms to extend on the way through, they can't be fully extended at impact. Um, and so I do think that hitting at the ball when the ball is there um, contributes to a lot of the common amateur problems where, you know, many, many good golfers have talked about swinging through the ball, you know, the ball just getting in the way, the club brushing, like lots of things that um, kind of trigger the, the feeling or the idea of swinging through with the arms extending past the ball like you would do in other sports as opposed to what many amateurs seem to do, which is swing at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think I think one of the biggest issues with that is that um, is that usually for most players when they're with their irons, their ball is fairly centered in their stance. Um, so, so if you were to think about that as baseball or tennis, um, or even hockey, uh, or or anything that has to do with hitting a projectile that's moving towards you you would never try to hit it by the time it got to the center of your stance. You would always try to hit it out in front of you and move towards it. Um, and I think that I've noticed that many players, they uh, even if they move the ball forward a little bit, they're still trying to hit it as if it was center. Um, and, and, and when I relate that to them in baseball terms, which is what most of us have grown up playing in America, Mm -hmm. they totally realized that that's not what they would do at all. Um, so that that full extension of, of the trailing arm um, wants to happen through impact, after impact, as opposed to at. Um, I've also noticed, too, that when that full extension happens at, now there's a change in postural release, um, and then there's, and that can lead to thinner fat shots uh, because the brain at the last second knows that it's going to miss, so it's going to do something to adjust um, on the fly, and it'll either hit it fat or it'll catch it thin, and now you have um, uh, lower spin, lower trajectory, uh, lower compression, uh, lower smash factor, all those things are involved. Yeah. Yeah. Um. One of the common reasons that I see amateur golfers tend to err on having the ball back is um, if you have more of a kind of a trail wrist flip or a scoop, right? When you when you flex the wrist and you your shoulder goes into um, internal rotation, it will tend to move the it'll close the face and it'll um, move the path to the left. So if you don't change their swing and you just move the ball position forward they'll tend to hit fat pulls or fat pull hooks. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things where you, you've you got to understand how each of the pieces fit together so that if you, um, that ball position may be a critical piece of, of their, you know, how they're controlling the face. And so if you're going to move that critical piece, you got to give them a different way to, to square the face, which is why I do a lot of release training and, and learning how to square the face better. Right, right. Are you an advocate of, of, a, of a pretty much standard ball position for all clubs um, across the board in general? Um, so, And I'm, I'm talking on a level lie here. I'm not yes, talking on, on, you know, I mean, I'm not talking in the real world. Um, yeah. And I think that that can get confusing um, to a lot of players is because ball position is dictated to lie. And, 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 uh, and I think that when a lot of players are looking at ball position or on the lesson tee or um, they're trying to find a consistent ball position, and really when you're playing in the real world, there is not an exact consistent ball position unless you're on a level lie. Um, yes. But are you an advocate of that, or, or do you like to okay. see that, um, that ball position um, varies due to clubs uh, you know, on a level, and we're talking on a level lie here? Yeah, I mean, 
I, I would have said um, I have two answers to that. I think there is an ideal ball position for each individual golfer for that day. Okay. Um, I do think it can actually shift day to day because the the swing of all slightly. Um, so uh, practically, I'm a bigger fan of of training low point control independent of ball position. So I want you to be able to control low pos- low point too far back, too far forward, so that when you get on those uneven slopes, you, you take a couple practice wings and you can control your low point to a pretty high high level. Um, but I do think that you know physiologically, anatomically, biomechanically, there's a ideal ball position for each club. Um, you know, given how you power the swing and how you release the club. Right. I agree. Um, I know that for me, when it comes to ball position, I always try to say to my to my students, um, find your low point for the lie that you're in right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you can take a practice swing next to the ball, find the low point, then you're going to find the dip, the ball position because you always want the low point to be ahead of the ball. I said, if you can do that, now you will know what the low point is and where the ball has to be in your stance for the shot that you're facing at this moment. Um, and, and I believe that that's always worked for me, um, and I think that, that it's a good rule of thumb for most of those players out there who really are unsure about ball position, you know, and, 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 and on different lies. And a lot of times um, I always say to them, if you were to hit this ball, how many times have you played – and you've hit a ball and then realized the lie was not what exactly what you thought it was. Um, and that's why yeah. you hit it thin or you hit it a little bit to the right because it was a little bit below your feet or it was a little bit more of a side hill lie than you anticipated. I said, but if you take that practice swing right next to the ball, find that. Now you're gathering the information um, and which will make you be able to take a much better shot and have a much better idea as to what you're about to do here. And then you're going to, the result's usually going to be a better shot. I know that I get the answer sometimes where they'll say, yeah, well, I don't want to take a bunch of practice swings because it's going to take longer to play my round of golf. Um, but I believe that uh, if you know what you're going to do, you're going to hit the ball better and it's not going to take longer. If right. you just step up there, you could hit the ball anywhere, and now you're spending time chasing the ball or maybe looking for it. Yeah, I mean, 10 extra seconds for one shot, if it means that you have to sh- hit two less, is probably going to save you time. Yeah, I think, too, that it also kind of um, it ingrains what you're about to do in, you, in, your, in your motion, yeah. you know, and it kind of soaks it in to, 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 to build up your confidence a little bit. We all know that if we don't have confidence in what we're about to do, it's usually not going to be a very good result. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, this past weekend, I had uh, Debbie Cruz out here um, doing a little uh, golf school uh, with me for some of the membership. And, and the, she has a, a couple of really cool experiments of showing you what happens if you don't have a clear focus of intention before going, before you approach the ball. So, if you, I, I completely agree that taking, especially on uneven lies, taking a few extra practice wings to get a really clear um, commitment to the shot you're about to hit will, will ultimately save you time and, and strokes. Well, I know that when I um, go to tour events and I see them on certain, you know, not every single shot, but on certain shots that, are, that they're not really sure about, they're taking two, three, four, five, six practice swings feeling what's going to happen what is the grass doing what is this doing you know? but when you watch an event on television you never see that kind of stuff unless right. it's being done by the leader if it's being right. done by the leader they're going to pay attention to the leader um, but if it's being done by some of the other players in the field that takes up unnecessary time in order to uh, golf can be kind of for some people boring to watch so so they want to make it as moving as possible and, and not show a bunch of the extra stuff. Um, I think if they showed some of that extra stuff, it would be a lot more beneficial for the viewers because they would really realize what are these guys doing before they hit a shot. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Because they're just not walking up and just hitting the ball like, like you see a lot of amateurs do. I mean, they just step no. up there and hit it. and it's uh, Or they step up there and they freeze over it for about 10 seconds, and then they hit it. Right, which 
clearly indicates they didn't have a clear plan going up to the ball. They were figuring it out over the ball. Exactly, exactly, yeah. which is not a very good thing to do. Don't be thinking okay. over the ball. It's, it's kind of no, like, yeah. are you thinking about what's going to happen when a 90-mile-an-hour baseball is coming in? I mean, not that too many yeah. people have ever done that, but you're not thinking about what you're going to do, really. You're waiting for it to happen and reacting. Yeah. So no, the more if you're, you can make it reactive, the better. If you're in the language center of your brain, if you hear yourself talking when you're over the ball, you are not in the place where performance happens. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. So tell us a little bit about the book that you have. Um, um, and 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 give us yeah. an you know give us some insight yeah. into what they can learn there. Yeah, get the, get it up there nice and tall so we can see it. Excellent. This is one of the you know one of the proof copies, but it's uh, 350 pages or so. Um, it it pretty much walks through the. I wanted to do a book that um, tied in all the videos that I do on the website. So I wanted to do a book that covered what do you want the club to do. How can the body do it? How should you train it? So kind of the, you know, I wanted golfers, especially my students, to, to always have a real reason for anything that they were going to do. Mm. And I wanted them to understand even just on a high level what the change that they were going to make would do to the club. So a common example, um, I do a, a clinic where I talk to, you know, it's targeted more at higher handicap golfers. So I always ask and 90% of the people taking the clinic slice the ball. And then I'll ask them, well, how many of you want to get more open at impact, right? How many of you feel like your body is facing the golf ball at impact? And usually everyone that slices the ball says they need to get more open. And then I point out to them that if they were to just get more open, that would actually open the club face more and they would hit instead of a pull slice, they would hit a push slice and probably slice it worse. Right. So, so tying together and relating any swing change that you're going to make to low point or face control like having a real understanding um i didn't i didn't see one book on the marketplace that kind of tied it all together so i i set out a few years ago to to try to organize that information um so it's got a few a few 3d graphs but it's got um images from the gear system to show kind of to to create some images for golfers who may not have access to that and then it's got about 350 um, pictures showing me demonstrating kind of some of these subtle differences between what makes, you know, the tour swing versus what makes kind of the amateur cast swing. Sure. Um, and then uh, if, if any golfers want to go into greater depth in any one section, I have the, the videos on my website where, you know, I, I do three to five minute videos talking about each of the concepts. Um, so awesome. It, uh, yeah, it was, um, I, I started with the website first and then when, um, it got to a point where I had about 500 videos on there and uh, I was starting to realize that if you came in as a new member, it was a little bit challenging to figure out where to start. Right. So I overwhelming. Wanted, the book was really the goal to make it less overwhelming, make it more of an A to Z. And then the website has a little bit greater detail but you have to kind of know where they fit in order for that to be really beneficial. Right. Process of how long it took you from the time you decided that you were going to do this book to the time that it was actually, that you could pick it up and it was tangible in your hand. Uh, two and a half, three years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, a lot I, of thought work. Take, I thought it would take six months. Yeah, I uh, think we all think that things will take... Yeah. Take, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people who think that they're going to get better in golf in six months too. Um, but no, it's uh, it's taken quite a while, and uh, I'll be I'll be excited to have it out there here in the next few weeks. Which is awesome. So, and when this show is released, it'll already be out there. Yes. Um, which is great, and we'll have in the show notes, of course, uh, where they can get the book and and uh, and how they can get in touch with you and. And, yeah. um, and if they want to come work with you or, or uh, you know, pick your brain or talk to you on social media or anything like that, um, all that information will be there. So uh, can you tell for our listening audience, um, what is the best way to get in touch with you? And then when the book is released, what will be the best way for them to get their hands on it? Because I think that it's really important that, that everybody who's listening to this gets their hands on that book. Yeah, um, 
You know, I'm I'm spotty with social media, so the most consistent way to get in touch with me is uh, is through my email, just Tyler at golfsmartacademy.com, um, and the the book will be available on Amazon as the and Barnes and Noble and kind of the the large retailers will also sell it through the site, but um, Amazon's probably the easiest where um, everybody's used to just type it in either by my name or the the title is the stock tour swing. Um, okay. It's really my presentation of what I've learned about use uh, kind of you know from behind the curtain what I've what I've seen with the 3D data and and applying it to amateurs golf swing. So I think that it it would be great for either a coach or that kind of high level you know kind of nerdy golfer that likes to likes to read everything and study everything. Yeah, I think there's a lot of them out there. Um, yeah. I mean, there definitely is. I mean, I know that, that I was one of those guys when I started playing, and and then it, and I got so nerdy at it that I decided I wanted to teach it. So, And, and I'm glad I did. Because um, yeah. it's, it's just, to me, it's still, um, there's so much information to uncover still at this point. I mean, and, and right now, I feel like with with books like yours and some of the other work that some some guys are doing out there in 3d um that it's it's we're just starting to really scratch the surface now and and get into what we can really find out data wise about what is going on and and hopefully within another 10 years uh it'll it'll totally change the way people play golf and and or what i want to say is learn golf yeah yeah, one of my one of my goals is that if anybody is willing to put in the time, they should get better at golf. And that wasn't I, I, I don't think that's always been the case. There's lots of golfers who put in countless hours but don't really get any better. And it's it's my goal to to help change that. Right. And I think that that's part of what um what a lot of the the instructors today are are bringing to the forefront is because I think there are because of all this technology they can really see the nuts and bolts of what it yeah. takes to get better um, yeah. whereas before I think we were just kind of a lot of guys were just kind of guessing or or taking yeah. or getting information from what maybe some other pros have said that worked for them but it was it's really hard to translate that but when you can break it down into data um, it it makes so much more sense um, yeah. and logical sense and and that's what really data does it, it makes it makes things more logical uh, so so once again what's the website that uh, that they can find you at though my website is golfsmartacademy.com okay and where are you exactly are you located I'm located in Los Gatos uh, California so it's about 15 20 minutes south of San Jose Airport for anybody that flies in it's pretty convenient for for either coming in for half days or you know multiple days awesome well Tyler thanks so much for being with us this was a great interview a um, lot of really good information there and um, when it's released of course we'll send you a link to it mm -hmm. uh, you know and and um, but but it's uh, what we always like to say here in, in parting is uh, until we meet again do your best to keep it in the short grass <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for having me. All right. It was great. Thank you. All right. You've been listening to Breaking Par with your host, Bernard Sheridan. Follow us on Twitter at Breaking Par and on Facebook at Par Breakers Golf Academy. Until next week, try to keep it on the short grass.